Start again. <laughs> uh, Dave Harding Pryor. Harding Pryor, yeah. <laughs> Dave, Dave HP, I can yeah, remember Dave the goldfish. There you go. <laughs> Welcome, mate. Has yeah. anyone ever told you that you sound like uh, a continuer? We start, finished off two seconds ago in a yeah. technical drama. You sound like Jason Fox. No. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> you sound like Jason Fox, mate. I think you do anyway. Really? Yeah. yeah Is he from your neck of the woods? I don't know. I don't know where he's from. I'm from Portsmouth, but... Oh, well, maybe. 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 Know. He's an Navy, isn't he? Yeah, but he's down, he's down that... Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that way, that, south. M- must, might have been, anyway. I don't know. I don't know. Um, three days. You said you'd managed three days on a vegan diet. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I did. I, me, and me, me and the missus tried it. We were like, oh, fuck it. Give it a go. And, uh, yeah, three days we went to ZZ's. They had the vegan options and then we were like, nah, fuck it, we'll have a pizza. <laughs> why did you want to, why did you, why did you, what was the reason so you So, you, have you seen that, what uh, What the health? So it's a documentary. It's a, it's, it's, but it's one of those propaganda documentaries that vegans give out. And uh, we watched it and I, and I watched it with open eyes because I know it's a, uh, I know it, there's a lot of lies in it. But we did it, gave it a go and then I was like, oh, I couldn't do it. No cheese like that. I could probably do. I could probably be a veggie if I really needed to be. I don't want to be, but I probably could. But no cheese or milk. I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah I always forget about the cheese bit. Mm. The cheese, and you can't have eggs either, can no. you? No. Oh, mate. No. So you get. Well, I guess vegetarian, you can. You can have eggs, and but I mean, if you're going to be a veggie, you can't really have eggs, can you? Because that's why not. Defeats the opposite. Like, if you're going to be a veggie for ethical reasons, well, there's the thing. It depends why. You, right? Yeah. It depends why you're going to do it. So this is. So I mean, I'm wearing the baseball cap, but only because I'm like I don't mind vegans, but mm. I like the baseball cap. I like the little phrase it came up with yeah. enough to put it on a baseball cap for myself just to wind people up because they're very touchy. Right? <laughs> Vegan activists are very touchy, I yeah. should say. But like you said, it depends what you're doing it for. So, uh, and this is why it benefits some. Friend of it, be, people see benefit in it because it's. But I mean, it's like a, it's like a what you call it, um, what you call it, elimination diet, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I did. Uh, <coughs> I went over the last few years. I think just on like on the mental health, just where the whole mental health awareness thing mm-hmm. and all that came in. I started, and plus I'm getting a bit old. I started trying to be more conscious in the yeah. way I'm living, and just because I want to live, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to die young, right? <laughs> and um, I started doing different diets and stuff. I did the carnivore diet. I did carnivore fish. Uh-huh. I did that for it was at least four months, four or five months. But just purely carnivore, like just purely meat, oh, animal products. Pure, yeah. pure, yeah, pure, pure meat and fish. Now I would occasionally, I say laps. It wasn't a lap. Occasionally, like a, 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 a cheat meal. Mm-hmm. But I, it was a deliberate, it was a deliberate decision not to go right. You can't eat anything. I did want to go. You can't eat anything but this. It, it, ma- it makes it like an impossible task. Yeah, I'm not, there's no way I'm not going to have a fucking. Like, you know, I don't bit know. Of pasta or something. Veg or yeah. pasta or something for the rest of my life. Anyway, it was really good. Expensive, mind. Mm-hmm. And a bit, bit boring. Mm-hmm. But it was really good. Um, like, I, I... Well, hang on. Let me rephrase that. When I say it was really good, I didn't notice any negative mm-hmm. be- negative things. Mm-hmm. Didn't really change stuff. Um, my... M- uh, my... I, I stopped getting... I stopped getting tired spells after meals. Mm-hmm. And I stopped in the afternoon. You get, oh, God. I stopped getting tired in the afternoons. Where you know people have, like me, I always get tired like mid afternoon and need a fucking nap. Like, yeah, God, yeah. I've got the end of the day yet. That stopped. Like, completely stopped. But I attribute that, and that, that's still to this day now. So, like, what, sort of the biggest thing that has, has happened to me through altering my diet, be more of a diet, is that yeah. I don't get slumps after yeah. meals. Unless I have the wrong meal, right? Mm-hmm. So, but I attribute that to I cut out sugar. So, the only time I love sugar now is um, uh, is in beer, mm-hmm. is in alcohol. That's mm-hmm. literally the only time I love sugar. Occasionally, I like the, we got the chocolate fingers mm-hmm. there. I have some chocolate fingers. Occasionally, I'll, I'll you know, I don't call it cheating, but I'll indulge. Yeah. Rest of the time, I don't have sugar on anything. I don't get an afternoon slump. The only time I get a slump is have a big carb heavy meal or your Sunday roast, yeah. you know, with all of the potatoes and all that in there. And I'll be like, oh my God. And um, and now I you know, on also as a result of all that, it changed when I when I needed to eat, mm-hmm. and now I intermittent fast, but not by choice. It's just what's happened. Yeah. So I'll get to like early afternoon. I, well, I I don't need to eat until like one, two, three o'clock. Yeah. I can get to the evening. I haven't eaten all day. That includes training in the morning or training in the day. I can get to the evening and I'll eat 
then I, yeah. I, I'm not craving craving I mean, intermittent, intermittent fast is good yeah, I'd, I would do it but um, I, but I, did, I didn't deliberately go in aim into it intermittent no. fast because like I think a bit like you I'm, I'm open minded it's like okay different diets benefit different people and you've got to have sort of a holistic approach to it all mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not of the opinion veganism works for everyone it works for a few people for different reasons like carnivore diet works for people but it's fucking crazy and you know you need to have a holistic approach to it yeah. um, but the intermittent fasting came about just through cu- cutting down the sugar and the carbs and so my body went back to you know the way fucking cavemen were and it, it burns fat it burns fat for its energy mm-hmm. as opposed to looking for the, what's in your belly for the energy. This is as simple as I can explain it. So I don't get, uh, I don't, you know, you get really hungry and go, Jesus, I need to eat. I used to be a person to get, get to 10 a.m. in the morning. If I hadn't had breakfast by 10 a.m., I would be going down. Mm-hmm. Like I'd be in clip. I need food. I've got no energy. That's gone now because yeah. the body looks to the fat deposits for the fat stores for the energy as opposed to your belly. Yeah. It's, it's been a bit of a, been a bit of a, uh, I can say a game changer. Do you have coffee? Something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that goes against, but what you, but goes against what you, the game changers, have you seen that documentary? What you're saying about the energy goes against what they say, and obviously that, what that program is to be debunked, I guess, by a lot of people. But, you yeah. know, you, you, the thing is, if you watch stuff like that, you, you've got to go in with the mind that there's, there's, there's views for other people. You could watch scientists that give you, you know, the views that are fucking... Meat, even the carnivore diet is good, but then people are going to push what they want, really. This and this is the problem. Is oh, I the fucking diet. This is the problem. Is that with veganism, that is a money maker, and it money maker industry now, mm-hmm. and it and uh, it attracts, especially at the sort of activist end, and, and anything to do with that ethical, environmental aspect. The kind of people that are attracted to that. Good people, wholeheartedly good people, emotionally invested in it, but very, 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 very susceptible to being spun yarn and being spun bullshit. Now, I'm not saying that the whole, like Game Changers, for example, that whole, that whole, uh, that was really interesting, right? But the whole thing isn't all bullshit. Mm -hmm. But when you start watching it with an open mind, which I did, I didn't finish it, by the way, because I start getting annoyed. When you watch it with an open mind and think about what they're saying, it, it was a lot of it was propaganda, mm. you know. But the guy behind, I can't remember his name, UFC fighter, the guy who made it, he's doing it, you know, all honest intentions, good guy, and believes in what he's doing. But an example from that game changes, game, game changes documentary, one of the points I start getting annoyed because I, I want, I want to, I want to consume information that's been presented in a balanced way, mm-hmm. right? What I don't want to be doing is watching a documentary that is talking about 20, 30, 40, uh, 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 what you call them gladiators from yeah. back in the day they yeah. just studied didn't they yeah. now these, all these gladiators from back in the day and, and they were able to determine from studying whatever the samples they had from these gladiators from years ago all came from one woman area as well that they said uh, so they were able to determine that the gladiators diet they said was vegetarian mm. right the gladiators diet was vegetarian in fact they said they're, they're pre- they said predominantly vegetarian yeah. Yeah. well they used the word vegetarian yeah, right, right? Uh, one of the, one of the scientists did, predominantly vegetarian, right? Now, what they found in the in that research is that the gladiators' diet was mostly veg, compared to meat. Then they used the word vegetarian. Mm-hmm. That is not vegetarian. Mm-hmm. My diet is mostly veg and meat. I have more veg on my plate than I do meat. I ain't fucking vegetarian. <laughs> But to say that in a documentary mm. like that, that people are going to hang on the word of, yeah. go, oh my God, gladiators are vegetarian. No, no, no. They had the same diet as me, sort of, mostly veg, and then partly meat on the plate. But because it's a film like that, and they're trying to peddle whatever they're trying to peddle, they've said vegetarian. Yeah. Bollocks. But the thing is, that they, and they, what do they use? They use Nate Diaz as an example, but he eats fish. You know, so, and the thing is, I watched it, and I, you know, I'm looking at it, and I'm going, okay, but... That there's there's athletes doing it right, but there's no one the best. There's no one the best. You, you're not looking at the best. Like they put that strong that strong man in, saying he's not the strongest man in the world. You know. Uh, and and some uh, I th- there was I can't remember how many, how many of those like top tier, arguably you know high level athletes that they use, but something like sixty or seventy percent of them were not a changed back from the vegan diet to the normal diet since mm. they're making the documentary because it wasn't working. Yeah. But again, I, I'd like to clarify, I've got no issue against the vegan diet. What I've got an issue is against things like that, documentaries like that, or people, vegan activists saying 
the vegan diet is the healthiest way forward and all other diets are bad for you. It's bu- it, No, it's not. No, it's not. Do you, want, do you want to know a good documentary? Right? It's yeah, called no. Kiss the Ground, I think you, it is. When you say good, is it, is no, it, no, is so it, is it, is it in line with what we think? No, <laughs> is it our problem? Yeah, yeah, so, no, <laughs> no, so it's similar. So it's talking about the, the diet and it goes on about um, plant-based. It's called Kiss the Ground. It's uh, Kiss the Ground or Kiss the Earth? Kiss the Ground. It's got uh, Woody Harrelson uh, narrating it. Really good. But it talks more about regenerative farming. And I think, yeah, it's just it's, it's really good. It, so it's more more on the basis of that. So it's talking about plant-based, plant-based being better, but it's also saying, it's not saying you can't eat animals. It's saying if you're going to do it, the way forward is regenerative farming where we have grass growing. And I mean, it's far out my re- realms of knowledge. But, yeah, you know, same. Yeah, it's interesting because Woody Harrelson is flat out, oh, sorry. <coughs> flat out tree hugger, isn't he? Hmm. And uh, I, I have to watch that. Um, but again, interesting. Yeah, that that uh, it's very difficult to find. Not difficult to find. You don't you don't get presented with that sort of alternative view on uh, I- I the the on farming, for example, mm-hmm. agriculture, for example. Mm-hmm. All you hear is the hideous stories. Mm-hmm. I've got a friend called Jeremy Gibbs who um, forces farming. He's the founder of Forces yeah, yeah. Farming, supposedly you know. And we've had some conversations and. He, his old background is agriculture, and he, we haven't got into the depths of it, but he'd come on the podcast one day, he'd probably chat about it then. But he was saying, look, it's like, you, not all farmers are a nightmare. Most no. farmers, they actually give a shit about their animals yeah, because a healthier animal is is better for them yeah. in terms of, you think about it in product, in inter- inverted commas, you, you want healthy animals because that breeds healthier animals and they got better meat and they, and, they la- and they live longer, less susceptible to disease and all that stuff. It's I think we, we also need to take into consideration we're watching it from the UK where <laughs> the, the livestock and the treatment of livestock is a lot different over here than it is in America because all these are American document, document, documentaries. Whereas in the UK, we're quite um, farmings. They care about the animals a lot more. Yeah, I think probably like the probably like the US though. It, you go to the wrong areas, and there are absolute assholes. You know, I, I I've been. Uh, I mean, you know, I've been like I used to horse ride a lot, and uh, you go to one sta- you go to st- one stables, one and it, all the horses are really horses are really kept well. And you can see they're really kept well, and, and just the good environment to live in. And you go to somewhere else in a different part of the country, and it's fucking terrible. Um, I mean, that's just that's an example of the difference. In, that's the point that is uh, there are some ourselves in the yeah. UK you know same as, same as you. should we get off the subject <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's way out of our <laughs> realms of expertise um, mate who, who have you been interviewing who are you interviewing uh, yeah so I just uh, there's a lad named Stu Nicholson he was a re- he finished he did 19 years finished as a major uh, yeah, it was good to just you know get him on and have a chat with him um, it was interesting to see he did he did 19 years he joined in i think 93 94 and um he didn't see us so so my podcast all about i want to get combat experience you know speak to people different people about their experiences in combat and his he didn't experience his first combat until 11 years in where he did his uh iraq i think 2005 something like that pull it into you yeah 2005 yeah um yeah, but also just listening to him, his first contact, he was, bear in mind, he was the OC at the time and they, they were in Snatches and Warriors, you know, and it was, it was a full on hairy situation and he was an OC dealing with it. And just listening to him when he came back and how we felt is just similar to how we felt. And being in, I said to him at the end, you know, after the podcast, I said, look, it's, it's good to get it from your point of view because as a normal entry soldier, you kind of sometimes not dismiss you look at officers different to how everyone, you know, because they're, they're officers. So you, you kind of look at them um, and think of them in a different way. Look at them and spit. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, you know, it's, um, so it's interesting to see, hear from him, even him, he was, so he was 32 at the time when it happened. So he's my age, my age now. Um, and that was his first time in combat. But he was, you know, an OC, so he was fucking rolling around with, you know, company of men and he's still getting back and fucking thinking at the time he said he said when he was when it first hit, hit the fan he had a little bit of a lull and he you know a little bit of a flap and he was like fuck how are we going to get out of this but then he looked around and he just saw his men just you know, like fucking playing the game and just getting the rounds down and doing the shit and he was like that's how i'm going to get out of this because of these guys 
you know, and it's just it was interesting hearing it from him, his point of view. How many? So how many for the re- reorg? How many? Um, how many people have you interviewed now? How many? How many episodes have you done? So that was my thirteenth. So third. And what's the what's the breakdown between officers and and non commissioned? So that was my bands? second officer. I think. Yeah, yeah, second. Uh, the first the first guy was Tony Harris. He was my one of my well, he was from my lot, but he um he was a good lad. He he still is a good lad because he's still around. But <laughs> he uh, he lost his leg, but he, he wasn't after the fact. He but um yeah, it was good. So yeah, that's my second officer, and the rest have all been scrope backs like us. So through through these thirteen, when did you start? When did you, when did you start? Uh, so I started July, July, yeah. yeah. I was my first one. Through the thirteen, is there anything? Is there anything that's uh, you've been surprised by that you didn't th- like? That you, when you've been interviewing people mm-hmm. and what they've experienced or things they said, anything, are there anything taking you by surprise? And they, like you think, oh, and I didn't think that you people have that experience. Or um, if I'm honest, just people, some of the sheer stories that you hear, like your instance, for for, for instance, you know, so your story when you're coming out of um, where was it, Gresh? No, last Musicala. Musicala. Like when you're like that story when you're in jingly trucks, get, get, and I'm like, what the fuck? How? How's that even? Like, you, you just can't comprehend it. If you if you weren't there, you can't comprehend it. There's no way of me trying to think. Like, I can't. I trying to comprehend it after listening to you talk about. It, I'm like, fuck. Like, I don't know how I would feel because. And then I re- after then I watched the documentary that um, of that. And um, I think actually there was... Here is a helmet, that one. Yeah, yeah. that one. And I watched them, um, the, because they've got the video, the footage, isn't there? I was like, fuck. Just trying to get your head around it. Um, I think people still disbelieve it now. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely think that people Would still disbelieve don't, it. I don't think it didn't happen. You probably don't blame them, though. When you, <laughs> yeah. when you hear what what actually happened, you're like, fuck. <laughs> it's mental. You yeah. wouldn't, I'd like when you think it was, hang on, 21st century. Yeah. But um, that's that was sort of... that. The reason I asked you that question is because... A realization for me, as I've been doing these podcasts and meet, and not just on the podcast and interviewing people, but I've been introduced to other people, the more mm. military people I would ever than I would ever have met if I hadn't been doing this, mm-hmm. right? Um, from all different cat badges, and one of the things I realize is, I think we have this. I think we, in general, ex-military, who served on whatever tour and experienced combat in some way, shape, or form, be that one contact or be that fucking hundreds, right? Mm. We have this thing in our head where. It's like that, or that sort, sort of unique to me. There's not many people experience what I do. Or if you're in something like pretty significant, like um, like Musakala or yeah. any of the other uh, big actions, Danny Boy, the Battle yeah. of Danny Boy with Brian Wood in yeah. Iraq, right, and you know stuff like that. It, you think that when you experience it, you think, man, like, you sort of in a subconscious way think it's not. It's a unique story, hmm. right? And it's kind of the the worst end of what anyone can experience and doing. But as I've met more people in the they stories, more. I'm the same as you, mate. I get knocked off my feet regularly. Yeah. I go, Jesus. Yeah. Especially about Iraq. Yeah. Especially about Iraq. When I when I speak to the guys about Iraq, because um, not a lot of people had experiences like Brian Wood out in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Like um, I think Gez Jones had it pretty tasty out there as well, mm-hmm. didn't he? Um, we forget about that, that operation because yeah. it was so overshadowed by yeah. Afghan. And some of the shit that went down out there is... is, is, is Comparable to some of the stuff we went down yeah. in Afghan, like absolutely comparable. Yeah, fucking mental. Do you know Brian Wood's story? Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was he was uh, declassified. That's what I listened to on. Um, that's that's the only bit I know. But I would, yeah, it was the episode one one of uh, uh, declassified podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. just just listening to that because I was actually I was I was well, I was away working and I was in um in Greece somewhere, just just sat on an island, lo- living it up, like in in the sun. And just listen, listening to that, and I was just sat there. I remember sitting on a bench, just going, like, kind of staring into nothing, going, holy shit, that's fucking, like, just, it was, like, it's hard for me to comprehend that. I can't imagine, like, a civilian trying to, who's not had any experience in that, trying to comprehend that, and just like, oh, fuck. And then and there's um, one of my guests, Lawrence Kayser, he was, um, he was, well, no, well, he was PWRR in Royal Anglin, but he he got um, discharged for combat stress. But he did he did like six tours, three tours of Iraq and three tours of Afghan. 
Um, he got an MC from it, but he was um, he was a uh, yeah, just fucking just some of the stories he was telling you. So like, fucking hell, like it was just, and it and it's different. Like your 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 experience in Afghan was different to my experience in Afghan, and yours was when it was very much you know like small arms fire, just a lot of small arms fire. And whereas my my time there was very much IED um, orientated, and it it kind of the, the Afghan war transitioned in different periods. Like, and then when Lawrence went back in, I don't know, and he was like Eric 13, it was still predominantly small arms. When it, I guess it's just the area that you're in. Eric 13? I think I'd, yeah. Eric 13? That yeah. was like 2011. Yeah, I know. Uh, Eric, th- that's, that was my last tour. Yeah. Uh, 2010, 2011, yeah. I mean, it was, sm- yeah, it was small arms, but it was also IED. Yeah, yeah. D- I, d- I think, but yeah, and Eric 13 was a winter tour as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, yeah, I don't but, um, know. it was it was his last tour he went on. I think it might have been, yeah. but it was. I guess it was depends on where you were in the country as well. Yeah, and people's mm. memories as well, mate. Yeah, definitely. Right. I, and I've got a, I've got a mate, a good, really good mate. He did the first ten episodes. He was his co-host of the first ten episodes. Started this podcast with me, Jared yeah. Cleary, right? And we worked together in Afghan a lot. We worked together a lot, anyway. And um, one of the things that's transpired since recently, actually, we were having a few drinks with some mates, and. Uh, Jared's memory, he 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 literally cannot remember contacts. Mm-hmm. He he well, we there was four of us there. Was, we did episode one hundred. It was me, Jared Cleary, Luke Hardy, and Steve Swellen. Good good friends, and we all experienced similar stuff, similar times out there. And you know, we were all snipers, and uh, we would just start as you do bantering, talk, reminiscing about this that event, and and Jared can't remember. Jared cannot remember contacts. He can't remember them. He can remember everything else. But he's got a block in his mind. He cannot remember the details of a contact that he, they even happened. So yeah. he'd be talking to some, about something, and he'd go, "When was that? You were fucking there. You were there. You did this. You did that. You did this." He's gone, oh, "Fellas, I can't remember. He can't remember. Like blanked out. And not just one con, not just one event. Everything. Mm. Everything he's gone. Mental. And fucking mental. Yeah, and, and and that's one of the things I said in, in 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 my, you know, one of my early ones is we all experience trauma differently. <laughs> And we all respond to trauma differently, you know. I'm um, well, I'm trying. I'm trying to trying to remember what I, you know. I thing is, I read a lot and I listen a lot and I forget a lot. <laughs> but um, one of the things is you you remember trauma differently. But there's a lot of when you you try and ask someone about a traumatic event that happened a week ago, they'll probably forget most of it. But you ask them about it maybe a year later, they'll remember more. Sometimes you just block out it, but then it works in the other effect, and you like your mate there, he just forgets about certain things. And then it's, so we all the the oh God, what what was I listening? Well, to? It, what I think what's happening with Jared is it, it, that's that's a that is a defense mechanism. Yeah, it's, it's not like oh, he's gradually forgotten. He's got no recollection of this stuff. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just, again, like you're saying, you respond to trauma differently. That is his brain shutting that shit off. Yeah. You know, completely. Ignore that bit because that was not a nice experience. Mm-hmm. All those were not nice experiences. But remember the good times. You yeah. can remember all the stuff around it, but yeah. not that, you know. Um, and the other one is how, the, how memories change over time. Mm-hmm. One of the things I learned over the last few years is um, when, you, when you're remembering a memory, you're not remembering the original event. Mm. You're remembering the last time you remembered it, mm-hmm. which is why memories become skewed yeah. over time. And it's it's a really interesting one, and that can happen really quickly. I think I've, I think I've spoken about this before on the podcast, but I think I think I think I might have spoken on Reorg podcast. I was talking to you. There was a an event in Masakala, and uh, and it was a few week, just a few weeks before we got extracted out there, and we and uh, we got interviewed by the Royal Military Police later on because there was a death involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was two deaths involved, but it was just uh, it was a standard procedure. There was no like um, suggesting anything was done untoward. It was an enemy action, and I remember recounting the recounting the, each one of it. It was before me and Jared found these two guys uh, who later died, and then we were joined by two medics when we called the medics to come help us try and save these guys, and uh, so they joined later on. Anyway, each one of those four had to go and talk through mm-hmm. the series of events mm-hmm. um we did that individually with the rmps and then we afterwards we still, afterwards we sat together and we just we were just chatting and then we started talking we hadn't talked about it before we started talking about that event and 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 
basically in that conversation we had after it transpired that I had it completely wrong in my head. Like the sequence of events, I had all I had I had the events correct. X happened and Y happened mm. and Z happened and A and then B and then C and then D and all those things happened, but I had them in the wrong order. Mm. And they and all those three guys and in my head, that's exactly how I recalled it. This is a matter of weeks before. Exactly how I recalled it happening. And and Frenchie, one of the medics, is like, mate, that's not what happened. This happened first, then that, then that. And I was going, nah, I could picture it in my head. I was like, no way, no way. That is not what happened. This is what happened. Mm. And then all three of them are going, no, you got it wrong. Like, fuck. I mean, well, it wasn't, it was no great shakes. It wasn't like, like I said, there was no, in, no uh, incrimination going mm. on. But I, it, I thought, how, how, I can remember that vividly. And yet I remember it wrong. I remember it wrong. Yeah. Again, when, you ex- when, you're, when you're experiencing the event, you fo- your brain's focused on getting your ass out of it and getting people safe mm-hmm. or yourself safe. Mm-hmm. And you, it's it's not focused on, all right, remember this, and yeah. the details and yeah. exactly what happened. But then you sometimes you remember the r- most random of random of things. Yeah. And you hear about people with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or some other me- you know, mental illness caused by um, traumatic events. And they can, be, they can be set off into an emotional event by the smell of something. Yeah. The smell of... Uh, that remind you of something else. Uh, fireworks. I always I, I, cordite, man. Fireworks, and I always smell oh, a cordite, right. and for me, that's uh, it's like a it's a familiar smell. It makes me happy. It's really weird. Yeah. Uh, and, but for other people, cordite be like fucking hell, or the or the something that smells like dead bodies and mm-hmm. stuff. Man, it just sends them into something because it's similar. It's fucking bizarre. Remembering smells. Yeah. You know what I mean? I could I do that if I tried. I know. Wait, well, <laughs> mate, fuck. You remember? The thing is, music as well. So do you, do you have, do you, music's haven't put you in a. So it's funny. <laughs> so I listen. There's a there's a specific. I think about this a lot. Specific. Often. There's a specific. Um, <laughs> it, it's not about talk, but there's a specific Offspring song that, I, that for some reason every time I listen to it, it just reminds me of when I did my paper round when I was like 13 in Australia, just like doing my like in paper round. But that song, I just oh yeah, I was listening to that in like in yeah. Australia. Yeah, I, <laughs> but also. Like friends, if I watch friends, when when we were on tour, we had my mate Egg had a, a pop, um, uh, an iPhone, but it had like a, all the seasons of friends on it, and we just sat there watching it. So, whenever I just we used to like he used to pass me his uh, his uh, iPhone to watch, and then vice versa, you know, I just used to watch it. So, every time I watch certain episodes of friends, I'm like, oh, remember this, yeah, same. I think I think about a lot that, that like the music thing, like. Well, for some reason, uh, maybe again, is this just me or is it everyone? Uh, but I grew up like in a really isolated environment, a farm in the middle of Wales or South Wales. Not much social interaction with anyone. And uh, but uh, my old man's LP collection, right? And for some reason now, maybe it is everyone, but um, uh, events, significant times, like you were saying, there's music associated with them, mm-hmm. and that can be bad sometimes. So uh, I, um, I there's four awesome tracks that I discovered one week a few years back, two or three years ago. I can't remember when you I'm referencing somebody who got killed. Uh, Matt Tenro, I think it was Matt Tenro got killed in, I think it's 2018 got killed in Syria, in Hereford guy. And um, he was on my team before that, before he went to Hereford. Anyway, this week I started listening to the release radar on Spotify, discovered these four amazing tracks. And to this day, they're like four of the best tracks I ever heard. They're on my playlist. But the same week after I discovered them, the same week I found out yeah. Matt got killed. And now when I view the tracks, it, they're amazing. And then it brings remember it Matt. Back. It's yeah. like, Fuck, it's like destroyed him. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I'd rather I did that. Yeah. I'd rather Matt was still here, but it's, it's yeah, just yeah. the point in the Cheers, music. Mate. Yeah, Cheers, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, mate. Well, I did, yeah, music, music does trigger a lot as well. It's, but. it's the one thing that can change my emotion on, on mm-hmm. like that. When I was driving you to come up to meet you for, for the podcast, well, mate, I was saying, you're fucking super stressed in a minute. I was really tired. And in the car on the way up, I thought, like, I'll stick on, I'll stick on Spotify. And I thought, I'll just put music on. I'll put some tracks I like to listen to. And, it, and within the space of five minutes, change my mood. Got you. I was like, bang, bang ready to go. Just because I listened to the music. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, I was a proper, like, what was I? Like, proper into Metallica. I love Metallica. <laughs> I was a, like, proper metalhead. Will I cheer you up? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. So whenever I get pissed off and in a shit mood, <laughs> honestly, I just, this is, I, I rarely listen to men now, but I do. I just whack it on. If I'm, like, not, like, sad, but if I'm pissed off, I'll just, like, put it blaring loud and I'll be like, just take me back to being a teenager. I just listen to Metallica. Like, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. What did you notice? Did you notice any difference between the way the officers recount their experiences compared to the NCOs? 
Um, do they do they articulate in a different way? Do they remember different types of stuff? Anything? anything um, like it's that? interesting. Yeah, because the the NCOs and the normal and the, the the pods they don't look at not that they don't look at it they don't care about the bigger picture. Whereas you know, speaking of Tony, especially speaking of Tony, he was more about looking at why we were there. You know, so he 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 dove more into that. Um, so it was interesting seeing it from from that point of view, you know. When kind of when you're over there, you're you're just there to get the job done, do the job, or um, you're there because you wanted to be there. Whereas you're not really looking at the political side of things um, while you're there. And um, and then with with Stu, you know, it was, it was it was more, you know, one of the things I said to both of them is. You know, you're you're a sergeant, weren't you? Yeah. When, you when you left, and I was only a lance chap. But you you know, NCOs, you grow to be a leader. You know, and some of the best leaders are ever NCOs. But being an officer, you you have to be a leader from the start. And you get some you get some good leaders, you get some bad leaders. You know, get some good officers, you get some bad officers. But you're there, like one of the. So I, I was very fortunate when when I deployed a like, great great um, platoon commander. And um, my platoon sergeant was my hero, you know, Simon Valentine, who died w on tour. But just, we, you know, the first time we lost someone, we, you know, we got contacted. Um, it was on a, it was on a bridge on, on the, on the Sang Canal path. You know, the contact and everything that the whole, the whole, if we, if we hadn't lost Susu, it would have been fucking amazing. But it was, we, you know, as soon as we found out we lost Susu, we, you know, our morale dropped and everything as, as you would expect. But then we had to go on patrol like the next day, and as an officer and a platoon sergeant, just trying to rally your men, I couldn't, you know, ad ad admit I couldn't imagine how hard that would have been for them to get that to do. But they were the, you know, they were both good leaders, especially Val. You know, he just spoke to you as as we would speak to each other. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so seeing it from the officer's point of view. Um, you know, when you do your own podcast, you're lucky because you get to speak to the people you want to speak to. You know, so I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't get on an officer who's not a good person. So the, the people I'm going to speak to are always going to be good people. Um, yeah, so it's very, it, it's, I guess it's a tainted look at the officer's view because it's officers that I'm choosing to speak, speak to, you know what I mean? No, yeah, I, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. See, it, it was an interesting observation you made there that we, as in rankers, grow into being a leader, mm -hmm. where they're forced to, like they haven't got a choice. They're yeah. straight into it. That's yeah. what, I've never thought of it like that. Yeah, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and like, you, you, you think about it, if you're, bear in mind, you're, you're, you're platoon commander. You're 22. You're going in and you're, you're trying to lead a fucking bunch of absolute re retrobates. <laughs> you know, like you'd, let's say you've got, you got fucking, okay, you've got a platoon sergeant who's probably 28 to 30, got a shitload of experience. You've got some full screws that are between the ages of 22 to 28. And then the rest of them are just, you've probably got a few senior toms and bods, but then you, the rest of them are like just 19, 18. And you've got to control them. And you're only 23 yourself and you just come out of university. Like, fuck that. Uh, I, yeah. Um, they must cack themselves. Yeah. Like the, the 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 Sanders prepares you to be a leader, right? Uh, no, it prepares you to prepares you to lead, mm. prepares you to manage, manage, yeah, yeah, and it prepares you to yeah, plan. Um, but like you're saying, there, mate, it can't. It, they, they must cack themselves coming out knowing they're going to go into a unit where the right hand man is going to be a platoon sergeant who's been in for X amount of years. Mm. Um, it, that cannot be easy. And I, I remember when I got promoted to platoon sergeant, I got my first platoon, and I got a new platoon commander, a guy called um, Smith, Mr. Smith. Fuck's his first name? Can't remember. He's, he's a cool guy. Was anyway, he CIA. Pardon? Mr. Smith. Hmm? <laughs> no, he wasn't. No, no, Agent Smith. No. <coughs> uh, but I remember sitting there in the office, and he came in, and I, I wasn't that. I can't think of it now. I wasn't that old. I mean, I was, I was quite young. I was quite a young platoon sergeant, but. In terms of experience, I had a lot more than him. And I remember sitting in the office and starting to brief him up on the platoon. And the absurdity, the absurdity of the situation hit me. Like, the, I, 
this guy's got a lead and he's getting briefed off me. He's been in two fucking seconds and I, and he looked young. And I, I when I was, just God's honest truth, when I was trying to brief him up, I was smiling and I couldn't, st- I couldn't stop the smile. Mm. And I had to say it to him, ignore the smile and just, <laughs> just ignore it. And I, I, like I am now, yeah. I fucking couldn't believe it. I was like, man, this is madness. Madness, because that was, we'd done two tours of Afghan at that point. We were mm. getting ready for a third. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, what, like, fuck. This is mental. Yeah. Why? Why is it you? And I understand how it all works, but at that point, when I was in the between sergeant's boots, and now explain, and I expect this guy, brand new guy, to come and take over, it's like wow, yeah. wow. I, I mean, like you. So you, as a between sergeant, you, you learn, and you you can adapt the way you lead because of your experiences of how you see other leaders. And one of the Stu actually before we finished, or as we were finishing the podcast, he asked me a question. He said, "What?" You know, I'm, I've am i been a leader, I've been an officer. Um, but what's it from your point of view that makes a good leader? From He said, "What from I want to see it from your point of view. And what makes a good officer? What makes a good OC or platoon commander? And I said to him, the, the thing that really mattered for the blokes is officers that cared. And you've got different, um, different types of leaders. You've got red leaders, which are the, you know, the autocratic you do things my way um no other way they get shit done but no one you know they'll a lot of people will struggle to follow them because they don't like them because they're not very nice people and from my experience the leaders have always done well you know i've liked and i've tried to mirror myself is the uh the ones that cared that cared about how you felt because it wasn't about you know because the job's got to get done but you've also got to do it. You gotta. If you if you're not there in the headspace, it's not gonna get done properly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, you, you, yeah, I think the best leaders uh, the, the, and they adapt to the situation. Mm. They adapt the situation. Adapt the leadership style to the situation. The people they're leading, where they are, you know, um, and on and what's been going on, all of that. But I think also another thing that, that makes a good leader. Is is apart from what what they how they act, it's what caused them is what has caused them to act like that. Mm-hmm. Who has been their leaders in the past? Like what has been their experience of being led? You know what I mean? Um, I was really lucky. Uh, I, I I was really lucky, and I had good. I think I had, for more the most part good commanders all the way through, and I like and they were of wildly different styles. You know, a guy, there's a guy called Al Watson, the next three par, and, oh. and um. I never had him. I never had him in 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 three para as as a commander. But he was one of my screws in depot when I was in phase one, and he was just he was just like missed, super relaxed, super laid back. You know, just like always had that. Didn't really give a fuck mm. a, a look on him. But then he did because he just fucking pieced you. I never had him in 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 in, in uh, battalion. But then when I got to battalion, I had opposite end, um, f- fucking hard and hard and fast like take no shit commanders he just just beast if he stepped out of line mm. if he didn't step out of line he were on the ball mm-hmm. you know uh and again and if you if you are in a if you if you have the wrong the wrong role models yeah. you, you, you're gonna either be you're gonna you're not you, you may not be the greatest fucking leader you yeah know? i mean you, my most of my experiences i you know i only did five years so i'm you know i mean my experience in the army are very slim to none but what what as leaders is my time after the army where I've seen people who've managed me or lead, led me and I'm like, well, I don't like the way you do it or I don't like the way people feel about you so I'm just going to change that and I'm going to adapt that and take that on because, yeah, because I only did five years, mate. I'm not like a, you know, I don't, I don't know too much about, you know, I've experienced a handful of platoon commanders and platoon sergeants so I try and, even though the most of the people I hang around, you know, that I work with now are ex military. So you can kind of take take it from that, but um you still gotta try and adapt your way of leader l- leading through seeing different people. Mm. Not easy. No. It's not easy, mate. And then um go go back to the officers. <coughs> Those ones who ain't who ain't cut out for it, <coughs> they find themselves in a position where they've got to lead and they fucking hate it. Yeah. I mean, and there's some 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 of them are terrible as well. Like one of the I won't mention his name, but I wasn't there, but he 
his first <coughs> one of the patrols, his mag dropped off his his rifle, and he was just not really well liked, and yeah, it wasn't a great one. <laughs> Um, do you work with? We talked about it before. Did you work with Paul Taylor when was Paul Taylor when you were in Spider? Yeah, spider. Yeah, as we call spider. it, Spider. His bloody yeah, surname. Why do you call Spider? Spider. I haven't. I don't know. I don't know why we call him Spider Taylor, but um, <laughs> Spider, Mister Mister Brecken. No, he. I'd never like because he. Um, so he he was in battalion before my time, but he was he he just ran down Brecken. He did all the pre courses of the beat ups, and so he was the sergeant major for the training squadron or whatever it was and he did um yeah he was the the head ds i guess for my nco card down there and just i just found it funny he's just a funny character yeah he was i don't mean you um oh God, a month ago now he's a funny character he's a i mean character. the thing the thing if i ever speak i want to do like a myths of spider taylor there's like so many myths around battalion of spider taylor it's like there's there's a myth that he once um <laughs> that he once built an op in his back garden and just sat up there for the weekend yeah <laughs> there's all sorts a absolutely believable yeah <laughs> absolutely believable <laughs> absolutely mate right. yeah him and uh what uh what's his, his dog's called hercules he calls him king of the mountain doesn't he <laughs> hercules king of the mountain dog lead you unless the dog lead you yeah fucking hell uh, yeah the, the, um just his Obviously, the, the longer you spend in the army, you, in the military, you use you get to know different terminology, and you you can bring that into your daily life. But he just has a way of just making everything like a military terminology, and just I just found it hilarious. Just you just sit there and he just just start talk like little things like rebomb your water mount, you know, your water bottle, and I'm just like just start giggling, you know. I'm just there, just rebomb your water bottle. Like, Where was this? Just on the NCO card, I mean, right. it's like, make sure you rebomb your water bottles. <laughs> Who says that? <laughs> Come on. But it's like, there's a way of bringing everything into it. Like the, you know, and he was, was he, um, I can't remember. So we were at Dixie's Corner or something, and then Sammy, my mate, was slagging off the DS in the, in the, in the toilets or something. And then <laughs> Spider, Spider walks out of the, the cubicle. He goes, McEwen, make sure you check your bat blast. And then walks off. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it fucking comical. Fucking have you had him on? Uh, have you had him on Real no, yet? No. no. Are you going to get him on? I mean, yeah, it'll be good to get him on. Um, I've had a good story. So, uh, John McAuliffe, who's he's now the war, um, welfare officer of Fusiliers, uh, Ali, but he he just spoke. He just made a few co uh, stories about Spider, about what they did in Kosovo and stuff. <laughs> so it'd be interesting to get him on there. Mm. Yeah, I don't know, it might be, might be, might be something I look into. Thing is, I also want to try and, because obviously I've done thirteen episodes and probably nine of them are fusiliers, so I don't want to be, I don't want it to be a fusilier only podcast. I'm trying to just be a bit more, you know, get more other people on. Cause yeah, I, I <coughs> bit of advice on that one. So I, I started, I that's what I, I did with HR. It's like right. This cannot be reg tastic because mm -hmm. as much as the reg blokes would love that, it it in term, the reg blokes aren't the only experience I can I can go and tap into, mm -hmm. and like we were talking about earlier, people have different experiences and and different have different things to contribute, right? Um, and so I went on a mission to a, like I I'm really conscious of can't be reg bloke every episode. Do you know what happened, mate? <laughs> Fucking bootnecks. <laughs> Honestly, I ended up having loads of bootnecks on. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how it happened. I don't know, and I had, had hardly any reg blokes on. So now I don't care, yeah. like, because as the podcast has grown, so has my network of mm -hmm. military people outside of the reg. Mm -hmm. Right? As you start off, invariably your network is predominantly fusiliers. It's yeah. just one of those things. But as it's I wouldn't worry about it, mate. I would mm -hmm. honestly, I wouldn't, yeah. because uh, you might end up like me, end up with a bunch <laughs> of fucking, I don't know. I don't know, Anglians or PWR yeah. or fucking bootnecks I mean, again, mate. I've got, I've got some good ones. Bootnecks like. love the line like yeah, though. They I mean. fucking love it. That's the other thing. They fucking love it. <laughs> okay, what was it? Um, have you seen that? Did I send it to you? I don't think I did. You know that Game of Thrones? Have you ever seen that Game of Thrones thing? I'll see if I can. You know, they've got like Im uh, images of, ge of um, Game of Thrones and what they could be. No. Oh, mate. Let me oh, what? It. The uh, units? What? What yeah. each character, yeah. what unit they are. No, I've not oh, seen that. Mate, it's fucking hilarious. Where is it? So this is great podcasting. Where is it? Oh, who did I send it to? I send it. 
So, because obviously I've got a lot of power mates and um, marine mates, and I've, the marine one's just the best. Because <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Is that they're good fighters, but they're a bit gay. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think I have seen that. Yeah, I think I have seen that. I have seen it. Anyway, and powers is what was it? Which ones are powers? Um. Oh fuck no! I don't know. Daryl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but, but one of the guests I've got, I'll, I'll get in the new year is a uh, is a TA lad, and he he reached out to me and he, you know he said, oh, have you ever thought about getting into someone from the TA? And you know I, I said to him. I hadn't thought of that before, but yeah, like the thought of, can you imagine doing what you did, going away for six months? Because he, he was with the, I think it was the Lanx, and he was on Herrick 11, and he was meant to just go out there for a six month, and and I think he was just meant to stag on, but he ended up being in a rifle platoon and going out on the ground and getting smashed, and uh, can you imagine doing your tour and then going back to your civvy job? two weeks later or whatever, you know, after you come back for six months and just trying to get that process of being a normal civvy again. Like, I couldn't. Like, so, I'm, so yeah, so that would, that would be interesting, getting, you know, getting it from his point of view and how we try to integrate back into being a civvy. You know, when, even if you did your six-month tour, you signed off when you got back, you still got a year to, to become a civvy. And that, even though that's going to be hard. Yeah, but, but I think, uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, it's hard. But I think even, man, I think uh, just for some of my own experiences, even just coming back from being on an operation like that, just coming back to not being on the operation, yeah. going from being on the operation to not, that was, uh, I found that hard enough. Yeah. Well, I was still in. Yeah. I was still in. Yeah. It's like, fucking hell. Uh, because it's just the, the shock, and the, not the shock, just the difference in what you're doing. Just life, not on ops, is complicated. Yeah, on hops. Life on hops is very, very, very simple. simple. Very simple. Yeah. Simple is not very easy, right? It's very simple. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I really, really struggled with. Um, but going going on, you know, on going back there, you talk about uh, you know, going to your civic job, and so you, you, you leave and you have six months or year before you get out. I think it was Tom Martinson I was talking to, and Tom Martinson's ex Raf Reg, mm -hmm. and. Um, Suffers with uh, suffered with uh, complex PTSD. Manages really well. He he runs Lift Off. He owns Lift Off Films now. Mm. Does film a fucking brilliant guy. Fucking brilliant guy, right? And um, I think what happened to him? I think it was him. Basically, left the mill. S some fucking crazy shit. Like well, left the, left the tour. Some crazy shit. I wish I could remember the bloody story now. And then ended up in uni within a matter of weeks. Mm. So not just back in his job. In a civvy job, he's in uni, uni. with students, <laughs> and he's like he's five, ten years younger than him, whatever. And he's going, "What the fuck is going on? What yeah. is going on? I could that I could not do." Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was him. when I left the army. I was meant to, I, I I was leaving. I left to play professional rugby. That didn't transpire. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then I wanted to go to uni, and then the thought I was just about, you know, I was doing all the process, and then the thought of just going to university, I was just like, oh, I can do it. So I so I didn't and pulled the plug on that. Why? What was the what was what did you not like about it? Why do people why do people what is it that makes people struggle to come back to that? The of irony of it, the irony of it is I didn't do it because I didn't want to rack up loads of debt and be like in in the army where I was in a full time job and then go to university and then rack up loads of debt because it was it was the year when it went from three thousand to nine thousand. That just co coincided perfectly with me leaving the military. I was like fucking brilliant. And then I was like the thought of me being in like 30 grand a debt to, to do it and then I was like <laughs> the irony or the irony is I then struggled as I left and I was end up doing this minimum wage job and I, you know it's just like fuck I should have just done it but you know you can't but yeah so it was just the thought of going to being at uni being, I, was, I would have been 23 which wouldn't have been too bad like I would have been still young but I just thought about the debt and then ended up Moving to London and racking up debt anyway, so I was like, fuck you know. What, what did you leave for? What did you get out for? So I, le I left to play professional rugby because um, I played in the army for the under twenty threes and the combined service under twenty threes army A team. Um, stupidly, I was like, do you know what? I'll give it a go because I want to. Because obviously, you're you're a big rugby fan. Did you 
but then the power is rugby's not big. It's, it's in in infantry in England, the, the English units, it's not big. If you're a Welsh unit, you're all Welsh. They fucking love rugby. You get loads of time off. Fusiliers, I got, but like it was almost as you would expect. I was I was looked down upon because I was playing rugby because oh you're getting away, you're getting time off. And I was like, well, I'm never gonna. I do. I didn't want to. I didn't want to transfer because I was a, like that. I didn't want to go to another unit. So then, so I was like, I'll give it a go and I'll get out and and uh, yeah, that didn't happen because my injuries weren't. I thought I would have been okay, but after playing, I'd had a shoulder operation before I left, and then it had about a year of rehabilitation, and then I just couldn't like just couldn't handle tackling seventy stone blokes. You're playing league. Uh, union. Union. Yeah. Um, like for for instance, when I played, so I got it was the first time I got picked for the combined services under twenty threes, and uh, it was to play at Twickenham, and you needed like two weeks off before my unit. I was always, we're, we're, on, we're on an exercise in Salisbury playing. What's the Tezex in Salisbury playing? We're on that. And, um, cause it's important. And they would, they gave me <laughs> the time they gave me off was right. I got, so I forgot about it. They, I was meant to get the whole time off the exercise to go do it, but it was like a two week exercise or whatever. And they didn't, didn't give me it. The OC pulled me in the office the day before the game it's like, oh, HP, we're going to give you the time off to go play the game. Like, I'm obviously not going to get picked. So they, I went and I, um, I was sat on the bench. I was like, well, you just ruined my chance to play at Twickenham. And, and then, luckily, I did get another opportunity. And I was like, wee. But, um, but yeah, it, rugby's not a big thing in the English units of the infantry. It's weird, isn't it, sports? Yeah. Sports are frowned upon. Mm. Depending, uh, unless it's the sport that your unit likes. Yeah. So three power boxing. Yeah. Right. And um, when I we're going to talk about when I took over that platoon, when I took over the platoon, now that conversation with Mister Smith when I was laughing my tits off, um, the sergeant major, this guy called Steve Tidmarsh, and he was also running the boxing team. Mm. Mate, I would come in on a fucking in the morning. The blokes would parade. My platoon would parade. And there'd be people missing. They'd be like, what the fuck? It only happened at certain times of the year when the boxing team's kicking in, getting ready for mm. the season or whatever. Like, where's, uh, where's X, Y, and Z person? Fucking Joe's. Fucking Joe bag, Joe 1, 2, and 3. Uh, oh, yeah, they got dick for the boxing by Tiddy. And I'd, I'd be like going on exercise or going to do some training or whatever. And I'd have half my platoon missing. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? Because yeah. they'd been dick. I couldn't say anything because the Sergeant Major, he's running the boxing team. And they'd be all be in there getting thrashed. But um, you talk about rugby, 7 RHA. Big, big rugby, rugby team, yeah. rugby mate. Um, yeah, three pies boxing, two pies boxing. Oh, I tell you what, randomly, power reg is all over. Randomly, a fucking bobsleigh team, <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> fucking bobsleigh team, the bobsleigh team. Yeah, what is all that about? Uh, yeah, and I think a bunch of, we got at one point we had a, I think half of the bobsleigh, the army bobsleigh team was, was, um. Was Reg, I think, but yeah, we had a fucking Bob City team. They're brilliant, <laughs> yeah, random, random. It's because they just need big men and f- fit men to fucking push it. Well, you're, you're stereotyping there, you're stereotyping <laughs> there, they <Dave>, big men. <laughs> 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 yeah, fucking hell. Question for you why yeah. did you uh, why did you start the podcast? What do you want to achieve? What what did you want to achieve, right? What was your objective, and has it changed now? Um, so so I started it so I didn't like like many units in. In the British military, at the minute we're suffering from you know, a lot of suicides, um, be that PTSD related or just uh, other issues related. Um, and it, it got to a point, you know, I think we're near double digits in the last, you know, few years. Um, I asked, I actually asked, sorry to interrupt, I actually asked Paul about this because when I went down last year, I was down with what when, what it was then, Team Rubicon UK. Now React was asked to respond, so I was doing a training course with them. A new Paul is usually a new Paul is open to talking about stuff like this. Mm-hmm. He hasn't got his head in the sand. He's a measured guy. And I said, I just asked him that. What? What's? What's the? You having dramas with mental health, suicides, and that within the, within the fusiliers? That's as simple as I put it. And he went. He shook his head and went, "Mate, it's a fucking nightmare." Mm. Because, and the reason I asked is, from my my perspective, 
that's from the people I know that, that I know personally who have who've taken their lives or tried. Um, fucking hell, it's far too fucking many. Mm. Just from people I know. And it, it means uh, so wider throughout the regiment must be fucking so many more I don't know about. I don't yeah. know about. It's like fucking hell. But is how widespread is that across across Asian forces? Because it's hard to tell how bad it is or how, you know, if it, it's hard to tell how, how difficult things are, how serious things are, when, again, it goes back to, like, the, the sort of the vegan thing, fucking um, outrage getting thrown up, and statistics, and this, that, and the other. It's hard to understand what's gen and what's not, and it's the mm. same with military suicides, military mm. uh, military or veteran suicides. It's hard to tell what's real. That's why I asked him. He just shook his head and went, fucking hell, it's a nightmare. Went, what have you been saying that 10 years ago? 10 years ago, we're, 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 I don't imagine, like, people at that stage... Who've been in before Iraq, Afghan? Ask the same question. They would have been going, oh, "It's a fucking nightmare, mate." Yeah. I, I don't know. I, yeah. it is a fucking nightmare. It, it is an. I on, think, and this is the analogy that I that I've used recently is: we've all got your point. You've all got a glass. You've all got a glass. It doesn't. People's glasses are different sizes, and you can all take a load of shit in that glass, but eventually it'll fill up and it'll overspill. And if you look at the, if you look at people who have taken their own lives, PTSD a lot of times is not is not the factor reason why, but it doesn't mean it doesn't contribute to it. You know, you get you go on tour, you or it all you know your life before the army, you could have put shit in that glass. You you go on tour that puts more shit in the glass, and then you go home. And then you have issues, G1 issues at home. And, you know, one, one of the lads, um, he, he took his own life recently. And it was because he was having um, custody issues with his kids. So it kind of tipped him over the edge. So it, it was getting to a point where I'm like, there's no... It, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast, as, as everyone does. And there was a lad named Trevor Thompson... Um, he was a SEAL or something, and he said, "I really appreciate what you're doing for the veteran community." And ironically, I I looked and I couldn't, I didn't know there was anything out there. And subsequently, I've sit recently, you know, and I know there's obviously a lot, a lot in the UK, and I didn't know that at the start. So I was like, "Fuck it, I'll do my own." And the pop, do your own what podcast? Oh, sorry, right, yeah. yeah so, I'll, so I'll do my own podcast, and I want to get, and it, you know, like like I've said, I'm not this battle hardened veteran. I I can only did one tour, and it was a pretty hairy tour. But I know a lot of them. That was, you know, I know a lot of people who have done a lot of shit, and I'll get to know a lot more people. And you've got the celebrity soldiers out there, but you've also got a lot of soldiers that stories will never get heard of. But there's a lot like, and I, and I felt we know a lot about World War One. No, no, we we know a lot about World War Two, World War One less so because just of the time period. And I, I, I just felt I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose people's stories from the Afghan war because it was, you know, 2003, four to, to, I mean, yeah, until 2015, really, when it was, you know, so we had 12, 13 years of fighting that there's a lot of stories out there for people to, to tell. And if I can get people like yourself on who can talk about shit that, went wrong and shit that happened then maybe someone who's struggling can talk to talk about it because no one you, no one talks to their family about it now, I'm, I'm very lucky I my brother served with me so we we you know and my mate Sammy he's got a best mate who's power edge um, anyway so the best mate so they talk about it and I talk to my brother you know I talk to my brother about it so I've got that person but if you you've done 10 years in the military you leave you go back to like everyone does they you know weekends they go go home and they've got their civvy mates and you've got your military mates <coughs> but you leave the army you've only got your civvy mates and to talk to them you, you don't talk to them anyway because you've not talked to them about it um and your family don't know about it so i feel if i can get people like yourself or people who've been in combat saw, seen combat and talk about it and show it's okay to talk about it then other people can talk feel it's okay to talk about their experiences because as men specifically 
we're shit at talking. You're not talking about talking about experiences, are you talking about the effect of the experiences, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. As in how it made you feel. <coughs> because that's Yeah. How it how it made you feel and because cause if we can talk about that shit, then when we're finding it hard at home from for from other shit, maybe it can make it easier to talk about, you know, pick up your phone to your to your mate, oh, I'm having issues with my you know, my missus or whatever. Um you know, I know, I know. I was very much a, you know, before like, I'm, I'm, I'm an open-minded person. I like to change my mind a lot. And before your, um, before you came on with me, I was very much a case. You know, in my head, I'm like, you know, we just need to pick up the phone. And you, you made a valid point. It's like, it's all well and good saying that, but you, when you're at that point, you don't want to pick up the phone, and it's, it's fucking hard to do. So. You know, and, and then, uh, as I've changed, my, my theories now change. It's like we just need to make it less of a an issue to do. And if it becomes, if it becomes more normal to talk about how you feel, I don't know. It sounds. It's hard. It's really hard to talk. <clears throat> it's really hard to talk about it in a not fluffy way. I can yeah. see the pain in your face. You're yeah. trying to you're trying to say it in a way that is not fucking gay. Yeah. You're, you're basically, right? You, you know what I mean? Pardon the expression, but. This is part of the problem. It's like this is part of the problem. Is um, I really feel like the way the campaigns have gone to try and to try and combat this uh, mental health awareness. It's all mm -hmm. we're talking about is mental health. People be more aware of their own mental health, mm -hmm. right? Or whatever stage it's at. Not assuming everyone's got it bad, but just mm -hmm. be more aware of it. So if it does get bad or whatever, and you can fucking deal with it, right? But I really feel like the camp, the way they go about the campaigns. They're doing it in a in a language in a manner that would work if you were trying to target women, mm. but not men. Yeah. Like, it's so like uh, men cry too. Like, what? Do you think that message? I'm trying to remember which one that was. Do you think that message is going to resonate with any fucking man? What are you talking about? That is, this is like who put that campaign together? Mm. What marketing fool put that campaign together? It's the wrong way to go about it. And to clarify, when and people like you and I, who know, when we're talking about, like, talking, when you're talking about, oh, people, you know, so you do your real podcast, and then people can hear and they can resonate, and then they know it's okay to talk with other people. It's not a, when you're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, excuse me, going to talk to other people, to me, that is this, is this, okay? Going to talk, this is how I act now, in, in, in my own journey and how I act now, this is what going and talking to other people means to me. How are you, Hugh? I was tricked, mate. Bit shit at the minute. Mm. Finding things a bit hard. But be all right. That's it. Mm. That is it. Mm. That's it. It's not fucking hell, mate. It's not that. It's just, it's, uh, it's being honest and open, right? And uh, when that is uh, me acknowledging I got, I'm not great at the moment. Mm -hmm. And two, I'm communicating that to someone so someone knows. I'm not expecting a fucking hug. Mm -hmm. I'm not expecting Safa to be knocking on my door. I'm not expecting the unit welfare officer to go, Hugh, is everything all right? No, it's uh, it's that little one I'm acknowledging myself. I'm being honest and open. And that is in itself a, a weight off me just by saying it because I'm understanding it. And two, someone else knows. Yeah. It's, it's no... That's, it doesn't have to be all this fluffy bullshit. And when you're talking about like that... that People listening and resonating. I understand exactly, mate. It's one of the reasons I started this. Did the podcast. I was in. I was in. It's about people being comfortable and being honest about how they're fucking feeling, yeah. right? At, at minimal, simple level, like I just, like I just sort of explained. I was in HR4K, Ben Garwood's place, HR4K in Colchester. It was about a. I think I've been doing the podcast about a year. Guy walked in, Reg Flug. I hadn't seen him. We didn't. We weren't mates, right? But we we um, sort of bumped. Uh, uh, bumped shoulders in, in the battalion a few times and uh, he walked into HR4K okay? I was like fucking hell I, I don't want to name him he probably wouldn't mind but I don't want to name mm. him I was like fucking hell how's it going mate and he went uh, yeah but, <sighs> things are a bit fucking tough in a minute but um, I was like, but you know I'm, I'm I'm dealing with it and that was the first thing he said to me I ain't a muck of right and the only reason he said that out loud is because he knew I, I'd be I would talk about it opening on the podcast mm -hmm. And that is a fucking reg bloke. Oh, let's take reg bloke away. That is a fucking ex-military bloke who 
would otherwise it never ever I would never ever expect someone to say that out loud mm -hmm. to me or out loud at all. And he said it to me in normal conversation. And inside I went, fucking yes. Yeah. Yes. Because that would have happened five years ago. If I had never started the podcast, that guy would never say that to me. Yeah. Ever. And regardless he saying it to me, it's igno igno it's never, it doesn't matter who he's saying it to. The point is he felt confident enough to say that out loud. Yeah. I was like, fucking hell. And then, That's then, fucking awesome. That is exactly what it's about. Exactly. And I don't think any, sorry, I don't think any less of him for it. People don't, I'd like to think, people don't think any less of things uh, of me when I talk about I, I, you know, when I found things hard mm -hmm. because because it's it's fucking it's just what it is it's just it's just what it is the difference is for blokes is it, it's the we find it incredibly difficult and especially military especially military whatever branch you are navy RAF or fucking army right it's incredibly difficult uh, one for a man two for military is to um be honest and open about a weakness, a perceived weakness. Yeah. It's just what exactly what it is. Yeah. And and it is a it is a, a weakness in a way, but it's also a fact of fucking mm -hmm. life. It's a fact of life. Yeah, but it's a weakness and that needs to be worked on. But, but we know. all have weaknesses. Yeah, That's exactly. just, and and that happens to be th that one that one of the things you that serenaded with me with what you said was it's it's not about like like he he, he said, um, you know, his, his times are tough. Right? Then you can reach out to his mates. And you can, you can show that. That's what really resonated with me with you is like. So what I did after that is I did a um, I sent a message to like quite a lot of contacts in my group, just uh, in my phone, just saying that, bloody blah, blah, if you need anything, you know, whatever. If you if you ever feeling down, but it's but it's about, you know, what you said is, you can just ask your other mates around him to just like, bit down, just look out for him. Maybe invite him. You know, you could have just invited gone out for a drink or whatever, which you wouldn't have normally done. Not that you wouldn't do it, but you can know, just that little bit extra. Just to give them something to look forward to. Uh, the, yeah, and uh, the, uh, I'm glad we're onto this actually, because people often don't know what to do, hmm. right? And there are, there are really, the hardest situation is we get someone who's blatantly got, a, got an issue going on, for whatever reason. It could be alcoholism, could be substance abuse, could be just fucking depressed, could mm -hmm. be Always unhappy, always angry, always which and these are like you know. I mean, th we talk these things happen occasionally, but we're talking constant days, fucking weeks, and you just you know, as a mate of his or someone who knows him, there's a fucking problem, you know, mm -hmm. right? But that person doesn't want to accept that, doesn't want to uh, like not own up to it, doesn't want to acknowledge it, just gonna fucking crack on. But from the outside, you can see it, yeah. And it's in, <clears throat> from a charity perspective or welfare perspective, because there's a similar thing going on at the moment. If they aren't willing to uh, go, ah, I could be living life better, mm -hmm. which is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, I fucking, I'm a clip. I could be living life fucking better and you sort myself out. If they ain't willing to accept that, um, you, you can't force them to have treatment. You, you can't do it. No. And, and it makes it really hard when you see someone going down the pan and you can't force them to have, uh, uh, when I say treatment, fuck, I about treatment. It could be anything. You can't force them to get help. Yeah. Right? Um, but in those situations, uh, again, like it's going on, on now with um, people I know, and I don't know the person involved. Uh, I don't know that. Sorry, I don't know the person who's in clip. Uh, but I know people who know him. They, they've asked asked me just for advice, and I'm, I'm not a fucking well for office, right? But but it's like my, my advice to them was one: notify people. Does 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 your regiment HQ know? Mm -hmm. Like, just tell them, right? And then they said the problem is he won't he won't have any of it. It's like he's he's been he's He's going down the pan at work. He's causing problems. Um, blah, blah, blah. And in those situations, all you can do is, like you were saying, notify people so they got it's on the it's on it's on their radar. Right? It's on the welfare office radar, it's on fucking a charity's radar. Yep, yeah, but they can't again force the help. And then you the circle of friends around him. They are the people then. They just they just need to rally, stay in touch, <laughs> and it's not, mate. You got you got a fucking problem. You need to sort it out. That ain't gonna work. They'll go farther and further away. They ain't, they're gonna even even less communication. They'll go harder on the bottle. They'll go harder on the fucking drugs. They'll go harder on whatever, mm -hmm. whatever bad shit's going on that's exacerbating the issue. But all you can do is maintain constant communication, regular constant communication, not fucking banging on the door all the time, but just 
enough so they ain't getting pissed off by it, but enough so that you can monitor what's going on. Mm-hmm. So if something takes a turn for the worst, bad, that you can go, hey, buddy, mate, are you in fucking, I don't know, are you in Aberdeen? Because John, he, no one's heard from three yeah. days and he's been going on the pan and no one can get hold of him. Can you go around and knock on his door? That's it. You can't do anything else than that. It's a, it's a monitoring situation and keeping in comms. Mm. Um, sometimes it works and people come out the other end of it, all right? And then, and there's different reasons people do that. There's a, a mate a mate who I hadn't spoken to for fucking eight years um, recently and uh, he, he was in clip and I, ended up, I didn't know because I, I hadn't spoken to him for eight years. Last time I seen him I was on the circuit in Iraq. Went down, uh, someone messaged me. I can't remember how the fuck I, knew, I got told about it. But he's not living far from me. Um, and anyway, I got his number, I texted him. And um, I ended up going down the next morning and he was not in a good way. And he, he was just drinking himself into oblivion. Mm-hmm. Like he was, and he had done stuff before that to, to fucking try and end things. But it's like, mate, what the fuck? And he, he was just embarrassed. Um, so <coughs> I, so I, I'm embarrassed, mate. Ooh. I, I don't. Want, and he was. In, <coughs> right. <laughs> he said. Uh, he said, "I'm just embarrassed, mate. Mm. Embarrassed about what?" And he's embarrassed about the fact that he's he's a man in with nothing, a man in in tatness, a man with literally nothing. You know, not seeing his wife, not seeing his kids. Uh, you know, living on his own, can't even go to work. He's sign off on work. You got. You know, he's struggling with money. He's just and he's just he can't sleep. He struggles. To, he struggles to sleep. He, well, mm. he can't sleep. So he started drinking to be able to get to sleep. Doesn't work. Now he's just drinking. Well, not now, but he's just drinking all day constantly and not wanting to speak to anyone for one reason: embarrassed. It's like, mate, you're not the only one. Yeah. This is not uncommon. It's like people struggle with stuff. You, you can't fucking solve it unless people know. Yeah. And again, it goes back to that. It ain't it ain't a sob story. I'm here to help you, mate. I'm here because I give a shit. You know, I, I, you know, I, I don't feel sorry for you. I don't, think, I don't think you're any less of a person than you were eight years ago. You're the fucking same guy. You're just on hard times. And you can't get out of it on your own. You cannot, in most of these situations, get out of it on your own. Mm. Almost all of them. I couldn't have done it if it wasn't for people, mates, some partic- specific mates, not a load of them, but it takes something, one person or, or one or two people just to connect with something, mm. to keep saying, speaking to you, and just to connect at one point. And you go, fucking hell. And then you you make a decision, you make the right decision, it starts you're on on the opposite spiral. You can't fix it yourself. This stuff you can't no. because it's mental. It's not a mental health. Your brain plays fucking tricks on you and it'll convince you that there's no option. There's no there's no way out. Mm-hmm. That's what it does. There's no way out. And you just keep going down. It's the only way you know how. The only way you know which you get ready to go. Because that is fucking impossible. Yeah. Because you oh, all of the options and all of the solutions are no longer on the radar. You can't see them because your brain's clouded by whatever. By thoughts, by feelings, by fucking alcohol, by anything. By family situations going on, emotional situations going on, fucking work situations going on, and everything becomes a fucking nightmare. And there's no way out. And it takes people around you to show you there's normality and there's options and there's ways to get out, there's ways to get help. And it all comes, that's what it comes down to, making the right decision. But you can't do it yourself most of the time. I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't fucking be here if I hadn't been for mates. Yeah. And then, and your your episode with with me was quite an eye-opener, if if I'm honest. Because, so so I'm on, I, I, I was on the other spectrum where I was, you know, I had, um, I, I lost my mum when I was 19. And my brother was 18, my sister was 30. And we had, my mum was engaged. And uh, the guy who she was engaged to tried to commit a suicide, like, not long after. So I was, you can see where it was, you know, it was, it was really hard for him. But, you know, my brother, he was 18 at the time. Found him in the kitchen. Sorry, found him in the kitchen with the pills and everything on the floor. And, and I was just like, in, in my head, I'm like, what? How how would that have helped us? Like, how would that have helped us? So so that was always my kind of outlook. And I was like, it kind of felt, to me, it was a selfish thing. But the more I've learned, the more I've listened, the more I've read, it's, you know, the, when at that time they don't—it's f- it's the only thing they can see, and you know—and and I think the more we we get to understand it, 
um, the more we can help people who are in that position. But it's not going to help itself and, you know, we need to talk about it more, as I think, as a society because suicide's the biggest killer of men under 40. It's, it's, not going, it's not going away. And it needs to be something like, there's no, there's no government scheme to stop suicide, but there's government schemes to, like, for there's, there's government schemes to stop heart, heart disease, there's government schemes, you know, stop, but suicide's the biggest killer of men under 40. And there's nothing out there. So there's, there, there is, but what I'm saying, it's not like a, there's no government scheme to help men in struggling times it's not widely spoken about it's still like a taboo subject but it happens and it's going to continue to happen and we need to do something about it where we're it's knowledge <coughs> it's knowledge um it's like no, it's no knowledge of your own self you look at i can speak to my daughters now one's 11 which 12 now sure 12 just turned 12 the other one's 15 i can talk to them now and say uh how do you how would you do? I could ask about physical injury. What are you going to do if you, you know, what would you do if you strained your calf? You know, if you fractured your leg or, or X, Y, Z, bumped your arm or I don't know, what cut yourself? How would you deal with that physical, that physical injury, physical <coughs> illness, right? And they could answer me. They would answer me in a rudimentary way at least or in a good way. I was going to say about fucking mental health. What are you going to deal with it if you, if you feel really, really shit? Mm. First off, well, even before, how do you deal with something? It's it's, I mean, it's being aware of it. Yeah, it's being aware of it. It's like I went through years, mate, years and years and years of having an underlying, just underlying feeling of unhappiness, underlying anxiety. Never dealt with it. It's just always there, hmm. and that was and 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 it, I still get those periods now, especially with the anxiety, but I'm aware of it. And so when I'm aware of it, I know I, I know I need to fix this. What is causing it? Mm -hmm. It's awareness of your mental. It's, it's just being aware of your mental health. And that 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 knowledge needs to start in school. Mm -hmm. It has to start in school. Yeah. It has to start at the youngest age because it impacts you at every age, mm -hmm. not just when you're 30, 40. It impacts you when you're a kid. Yeah. You know? And if we start bringing in mental health awareness, I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying fucking everyone should meditate and do fucking yoga and all that, but bringing mental health awareness at a young age, my God, I think it would really transform society. But but more so, it would make it okay to talk about. You know what I mean? It would make it... But the more it's there, the more it's out there, the more it's acceptable to talk about, the more it's, you know, you, you throw things, not throw things in people's face, but, you know, there's... If, if it's... If, if it's pushed under the carpet it's going to be forgotten about and it's not going to be talked about and it's being going to continue to be a taboo subject and people aren't going to talk about it but the more it's openly spoken about it doesn't have to be you know an hour a day sitting there you know going through lessons but it's just more one of the, one of the things i said to you know i i see it from different perspectives but i said john john mccallis now uh He's the welfare officer at the sec uh, first battalion of Fusiliers, but you know he was on my podcast. Um, and he, what he's doing more, he's just putting, you know, you get your regimental letters, your welfare letters that you go, to, I guess, to the houses and padwise and well, you know the pads and stuff. But he's he's just going to put like a mental health, not helpline, but like numbers for it, so it becomes. So there's always something there, but if there's always something there, then it's, you know, it's not. And if all of a sudden you don't talk about, you, you then throw like a page of mental health and all this is, it just gets brushed aside. But if it's always there, then that may help one person. It's always going to be, if, if, you know, if it's a double uh, sided page and half of it's about mental health, then it's, it's always going to be there and it's always going to be in someone's mind. And when people are struggling, instead of them not knowing where to turn, they can, they've always got this, but they've always, you know, it's, if it's if it's more of, more of the norm, then it'll be accepted, you know, eventually. And and the problem obviously is what it is. So the reality is of what I'm at now. But <coughs> everyone's mental health fluctuates, mm -hmm. regardless of who you are. You know, the most resilient person in the world, or the least resilient person in the world, mentally resilient, right? Everyone, everyone's mental health fluctuates. But the more the situation where I am now compared to where I was before, I can I see a lot earlier when anxiety is building up mm. or 
not unhappiness is too general a term, but anxiety or stress or whatever, I see it building up a lot earlier than when it, bec- than when it becomes a massive issue. I see it coming and I can deal with it a lot earlier. So my, so it just stops me getting to that, the bottom of the pit that I was before. It just stops me a lot earlier. Yeah. But, and everyone's on that journey to the bottom of the pit. They just they deal with things in different ways, right? Yeah. And, and, and those people who... Those people who may have experienced stuff that accelerates, it just means they're on a, there's a steeper slope to the bottom of the pit, you know, and they, they end up there faster than what maybe other people would, like traumatic experiences mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And they don't know and not aware, consciously aware of um, their emotions and what they're feeling. They just fucking end up there. And they, the first thing they know about that they, they feel shit is when they feel super shit. Yeah. And they've, and they've fucking pissed up. And they've lost their wife. Oh, they lost a girlfriend. I oh, ain't seen the kids or so fucking X, Y, Z. Yeah, well, we, they lost the job. You name it. You know, and that, that mental health awareness, people will just see it earlier. They'll just be aware, like you said, they'll just be fucking more aware. They'll see it earlier. And then generally, less people are in the bottom of the pit. Yeah. You've got a healthier society. And it's just, uh, that's where it needs to start. In my, in my opinion, schools is fucking teach it. Why aren't we? Yeah. Fucking 2020. Yeah. 2021. Yeah. Why aren't we teaching it? What's more, why? Why have they not realised the benefits from a, even just a money perspective? How much more productive the society would be, the country would be, is if everyone was everyone's mental health, the general state of mental health across the UK was just a little step higher. That's what will happen every year mm-hmm. if you bring it in. You start bringing it in at the young ages. The next generation will be resilient as fuck. Mm. <laughs> You'd be like the next Japan. Look at Japan. Yeah. You know, they're fucking ninjas. Yeah. Like literally. <laughs> But they've got really, you know, they've got a really good he- mental health track record, but they're really, act- just, they just because of the way their culture is, they do a lot of stuff that just, just helps with mental health, very active, they did lo- did loads of shit, but that's a pretty poor example to use, actually, because I don't know much about it, but you see my point. Yeah, you know, I, know you, I know what you're saying, and the, the more it's okay, and the more it's known, the, the, m- the better it will be in the long run, I think, and, you know, and that's... That's really why I wanted to start it, the podcast, and be a bit more, you know, talk about the hard shit, because it would so it's one of the statistics I use is you've got, so th- there was a King's uh, London College study that that showed, uh, I think it was nine point, it was like a, 11% of, no, anyway, I'm ruining it, but it's about 11%, no, this is about this, 9% people, veterans suffer from PTSD, right, it was, uh, yeah, nine, no, 7.4%, there we go, 7.4%, 7.4% of, I don't know how they got the statistic, but 7.4% of veterans suffer from PTSD, which seems, it, I, I can't see it myself, because, but, only 5% of soldiers see combat. So there's the, 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 they don't marry up. And I feel we need to, I don't know how am I going to say this in the right way. Again, if, if, those, if those statistics are true, there's a lot of people who have suffered from PTSD that don't, have not seen a traumatic event. And so, so A, there needs to be better study to just to prove that that's right but also if i can get you to talk about your experiences doing fucking getting taken out of muscala in a jingly truck then someone's experience that's not as bad doesn't seem comparable so they're like do you know what mine's mine's not as bad and i can deal with that trauma differently you know i look at you know i look at my experiences and i'm like the thing is, what people got to remember, there's always someone worse. There's always someone who's seen more shit. There's always someone who's done more stuff. And that that's my philosophy and how I've always dealt with it. Because I, I had a pretty shit upbringing. Like, by, by my mum loved me. You know, I've, so I, like, lived in council estates. You know, my mum was at one stage, we had three of us. She was a single mum and she was on the doorstep of the town hall sitting there until they gave her a council house. <coughs> Because they were going to put us in a hostel. My mum's like, no, you fucking not. You know, so it was it was that kind of upbringing. But I had a mum that loved me. So it was, and then um, Debbie, who who's kind of my mum. You know, Debbie is someone who's kind of become my mum. She's a uh, <coughs> she she's a foster carer. 
So I see the kids that go through her. She's like one of the top level foster carers. And fuck me, some of those kids have had hard lives. So I look at my life and I'm like, that's fucking nothing. It's not comparable. You know, and it's likewise in combat. It's like, you know, I had a, <laughs> I didn't have a tough day. It was, it was, you know, it, it was what it was. But then you speak to these people like yourselves or other people, you hear other people's stories and you're like, fuck, that's. But like you're saying, it's all subjective, mate. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, you get, I, uh, you can have someone walk across the road, go across the road. They don't hit hit by a car. It's a near miss by a car. The car nearly hits them, right? And they get post traumatic stress disorder, or they get some kind of mental illness at the back of it. Yeah. And then you get. I mean, I've said this before, this analogy before. So you can have that one extreme. But it's subjective it's about how people experience something. And you can have someone else. We know people like who did fucking two, three tours of wherever or experienced whatever crazy event, crazy event. Look at amputees. Mm. Look at amputees, mate. The amount of amputees I know, and they are like, their mental health <laughs> is like on the boards. Yeah. Like, how are you even fucking functioning? <laughs> how did that not impact you in any way yeah. whatsoever, apart from physically? It's just, and again, it's just subjective. It's, um, mate, brain's a crazy thing. Hmm. The brain is a crazy it thing. It is. How do tell people how to get hold of the Reorg podcast? So you can uh, f- follow us on Instagram, uh, Facebook, the Reorg podcast, um, or I've got an email at the Reorg podcast. No. The real podcast at gmail.com. And it's on it's on uh, it's on Spotify, it's, it's on, on Spotify, iTunes. iTunes. So you've got YouTube, you're not doing video, yeah. yeah not Just doing, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well. I would I would I agree you should not with that face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, we're here. Cheers, Thanks Dave. for having us on. We'll do it again, mate. Yeah. Cheers, buddy.